So welcome to the social media of politics panel with PodCamp Pittsburgh. Um, my name is Missy. I'm with PodCamp Pittsburgh. And we've gotten together a pretty nice little panel of, of folks here. Uh, tried to keep it differing political activity, uh, different social media activity as well, to kind of foster a fun little conversation for everybody out there. So by way of uh, introduction, we have David D'Angelo down here on the, on the end. He's done some PodCamp Pittsburgh events with us. And I actually met David going back in the early days of PodCamp Pittsburgh. Uh, I think PodCamp Pittsburgh 4 was where I first uh, met you. What was the, it was, what was the session? It was the blogging and content as a political blogger. I don't remember the specific title, but it was teaching. Was it, was it me alone, or how to, how to deconstruct a uh, political column? I think it was the political yeah. column. Yeah, that was, I think that was the first one. Yeah. That was, yeah. that was PodCamp Pittsburgh 4. So it's, was it 4? Okay. Yes. So that's, that's been a bit. And for those of you on the stream, check out that PodCamp Pittsburgh event on our Facebook page uh, if you'd <laughs> like to actually check out the, the video for that. Oh, YouTube. I'm sorry. The YouTube. <laughs> Thank you for that correction, Producer Mike. Um, but other than doing the PodCamp stuff, uh, David actually does a political blog to political junkies. Yes. Where uh, he talks about some, some interesting things with politics. And we'll get into a little bit of discussion about some of that stuff later. Um, I'll actually have you guys introduce yourselves a little bit more if you'd like to comment a little bit more on that. Oh, now? Yeah, sure. Oh. Just, just, just briefly. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, the, the blog started. There's two of us. Um, the other one isn't here. Um, uh, that's Maria. And we started uh, blogging actually April of uh, 2004. So okay. I think it was around 13 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, we started a blog um, uh, kind of debunking uh, Fred Hansberger, who was a local uh, conservative radio guy. And then by maybe six, eight months later, Maria decided, Maria was the other political junkie, she decided to, uh, she wanted to branch out and talk about other stuff other than what Fred <laughs> happened to be talking about that day. And so she, uh, uh, she came up with the name Two Political Junkies and we just started blogging there. and. Uh, uh, the rest is, is history. And here you are now. So I think there's 7,000 blog posts. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's extensive. Yeah, it's, um, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I think I average about five blog posts a week, every week, you know, uh, forever. Nice. Which is one of the reasons that we, we had you on here is, uh, is your, you. your political voice. So um, it wasn't the bribe. <laughs> Shh, you weren't supposed to talk about that. Or the, or the pictures no one's supposed oh. to see. Hey, those brownies were pretty good-looking brownies. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, and in the middle here, we have mm -hmm. Ashley Deemer. Now, Ashley has been involved with politics with regard to actually being involved in a politician's office. Yeah. As uh, Natalia Rudiak's chief of staff. And with Natalia stepping down, you are now running. That's for, right. For office. Yes. And incorporating some social media and some fun stuff as far as that's concerned. So why yeah. don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So um, I'm Ashley Deemer, running for Pittsburgh City Council, District 4. Um, I've been working in Natalia Rudiak's office in City Council for six years now. And when she said she wasn't going to run, I felt it was really, really important to keep up the good work. So here I am running for the May 16th primary, um, which is 21 days away for anyone counting. Um, and yeah, we've been using social media in our campaign to help get the word out to people we're not catching on the doors or at community meetings. And it seems to be working. Wonderful, yeah. Wonderful. Well, welcome, <laughs> welcome to our panel. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, a uh, face that we've seen a little bit along through some of these pod camp events that we've done is uh, Brian Crawford with <laughs> The River's Edge. Yes. Now, in addition, Glad to be back. In, in addition to doing the River's Edge, just in general, like the whole encompassing streaming radio thing, you also do a talk show. Yes. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So it's called River Talk. It is the first show that launched the network, and it's a fun show. I talk a lot about local current events. I try to stay away from you know this person versus this person, and, and more talk about a specific issue and where someone comes down on an issue and whether I agree with them or whether I think, you know, it, maybe there should be some changes. I also talk a lot with local artists and local musicians. And I draw on my experience. I used to be a constituent outreach specialist with the House of Representatives and uh, I'm a former councilman out in North Irwin. So I can kind of draw back on some of those experiences to 
kind of derive at my opinions and conclusions. So I think it's safe to say that we have some <laughs> political minded people and some social media minded people here for, for our panel this evening. So, of course, we're going to keep things civil. It's not going to be a, a mudslinging event of any. Hey, I, so you think, <laughs> David? We we know what you tend to say sometimes. <laughs> no, actually, I'm 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 uh, I think I'm relatively relatively civil. No, you're, you're good. You're good. Yeah, I'm the, I, I I don't think I. Well, I started time. swearing past couple months, but uh, usually, <laughs> if you see some, you know, the F word or any any uh, of the seven dirty words you can't say on TV, usually if you see those in the blog, then Maria's. That's Maria, one of Maria's posts. Mm -hmm. oh, um, so you conveniently toss it to the person who's not here to find herself. Yeah, yeah. If you see it written well, that's, that's me. No, no. No, honestly, she, she, uh, um, uh, she, when she, when, her, her blog posts are very, uh, they're very passionate and they're very uh, sharp and I'm really very happy that we agree on most things because I do not want to be on the other side of an argument with uh, Maria, because I, I would lose. I would mm -hmm. lose badly. All right. Well, we're going to go ahead. And I, I did send you guys some, some softball questions to kind of start the conversation going. But of course, we're all about organic conversation with PodCamp uh, being an unconference. So the same kind of constitutes here. And we have a live audience, people in, in the audience over here. Social so course, networking. Yes, social networking. <laughs> and we have Sorg over on the uh, the ones and twos monitoring the Facebook chat. So if there are any questions at any point, just let us know and we can we can address them. Uh, we'll have a more formal question at time at the end, but if there's something that's completely burning about the current topic or discussion, feel free to chime in. Uh, so the first question that I came up with, and to give a little bit of background on this, with the current state of <coughs> politics <coughs> and social media, it felt that we should kind of have a discussion about it. And, and again, no mudslinging, but it's going to be a kind of... So a lot of things going on. Um, which politician, local, state, federal, or even international, do you feel is or was most connected to constituents through social media? And can you give an explanation as to how they best used mm. it? Blank stairs. Any particular order? Um, go ahead. I mean, on a, on a federal level, I would say uh, Donald Trump. Not that you necessarily agree with what he says, but he speaks his mind. There's no question <laughs> when he tweets something that that is something that he believes. And I think the fact that he's in the middle of the night, uh, he, he doesn't drink, so I guess he substitutes Twitter with alcohol. And he sure? says what he wants throughout <laughs> the night. And... Uh, uh, again, there's no question, and, he, and he's very accessible to his constituents on a federal level. I don't think I've ever seen a, a federal candidate that's so accessible directly because you know he's managing his own Twitter and he's also managing the POTUS directly. Yeah. So, yeah. Whether you agree with him or not, I, I mean, I think it's fair to say that he's connected and you, can, you have access to him. He has access to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know specifically uh, with, with the last campaign, um, there, there was a lot to do with social media involvement. Um, Hillary, you know, had a lot of, you know, involvement, a lot of people speaking out with regard to social media. Um, do you have any thoughts with regard to? Well, for the, for the first question, uh, just touched the microphone. Anyone listening at home heard a very weird noise. <laughs> um, one of the things that that impressed me about when uh, Bill Peduto started being mayor is that almost immediately he would broad, uh, broadcast, he would uh, email out his agenda for the day, mm -hmm. uh, which I thought, oh, that's really cool. So I still get it. I don't really pay much attention to it. You know, you go, you know who's, who's meeting with whom, but it shows a certain amount of accessibility Mm -hmm. That, I mean, you didn't see that with, say, earlier candidates, but on the other hand, technology really wasn't there. So mm -hmm. you, you can't really say that it's, it's new because of him, but it's new and he's, he's using it. The, uh, I think the thing with uh, Trump, on the other hand, is, is uh, it is kind of a double-edged sword. Yes, he's very, I don't know how many million people uh, are, are his followers, but on the other hand, a million people get him, get to watch him say stuff that, just isn't true, and sometimes it's kind of scary. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, it, 
yes, there's a lot of access, and yes, there's a lot of content, and yes, there's a lot of uh, um, connection to lots and lots and lots of people. But on the other hand, when he says something that's just embarrassing, everyone knows it. You know, if he was just in his bathroom at, at home or yeah. Mar-a-Lago or the White House or whatever, saying something stupid, then only one person, like the Secret Service guy, would be the only person right. who would hear it. But now it's millions of people can can watch him say, you know, I would have I would have won again the the popular vote when he didn't win it in the first place. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah, you're right. He definitely a lot of the stuff he says is misinformation. And and that's kind of like what I was trying to express with my point is is it's not necessarily that he's right or yeah. anything, yeah. but he is connected. And to mm -hmm. go off of what you said with yeah. Peduta, uh one of the things that he also does, which I think is is helped with it, it's not maybe truly social media, but it's kind of in that same umbrella, is he does reach out to a lot of podcasts, which reach a smaller mm -hmm. audience, but reaches a more focused and more active audience. And I think that's something that's pretty uh, wise yeah. that, that he does. Yeah, and I think that all local elected officials get pulled into, whether whether they're tech savvy or social media savvy or not, they get pulled into being more accountable on social media. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're if you're a representative of a district in Pittsburgh, for example, you might get tagged um, in a discussion among neighbors about potholes um, mm -hmm. or about you know, any other issues in the neighborhood. And, and that's, you know, your accountability to respond to those people because everyone is watching and everybody knows that you just got that notification. And so it's not just a phone call to a council office anymore that nobody knows about. It's, it's in front of 300 neighbors on neighborhood Facebook groups. And that could be aggravating because as a councilman in North Thurwood, <laughs> I was a councilman during the snowpocalypse attack and mm -hmm. I was the, you know, the younger guy who was into social media, so everybody knew how to access yeah. me. So I'm getting everybody's complaints about the roads not being, uh, you know, plowed. And I, and, you know, and I just had to be like, look, every one of our roads was plowed. Irwin <laughs> sent out a letter a week later saying, apologizing to the residents because there were still roads that hadn't been plowed once. So, but I was the accessible one, so I was the one. And, and you're right, now it's, it's so easy to, to reach out to people. Yeah. So here's here's a fun thought that that I had again going back to the things are so different now because of social media. Can you imagine social media during the Cold War? Hmm. What, 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 Brian, you have some thoughts that's on this. Interesting. No, it's just uh, <clears throat> that's an interesting concept. I mean, in a way, we're moving towards that with a lot of what's going to go on internationally. So we may have the opportunity to live it. <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, okay, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> this is, this is, I have so many questions that it's, I don't know which ones to address first. Um, with regard to social media, is there a point where, this is, this is kind of a question for you, Ashley. Yeah. Having dealt with the social media, uh, Brian, you also, is there a point where you just want to turn the social media off and walk away from it? I mean, of course, you know, if you're sitting down to dinner with your family and you're, or you're trying to get some time in, you know, on your own doing something else you might like to do, um, it's really tempting to turn it off. But I always think that the best way to, um, help build trust with constituents is to answer. And even if you don't know the answer to say, you know what, I'm going to look into that for you, or you know what? Um, let's use this as a moment to educate the public about how to submit concerns about this kind of thing. Here's the link to 311. And by the way, here's Snowplow Tracker. And you can see, you know, where the plows have been, or you can see this or that. You know, we have all these new transparency tools at the city. You can, you can use it as an opportunity to um, educate people how to be more civically engaged um, rather than being on the defense all the time. And I think when you have that opportunity, you have to take it. So certainly you want to sleep sometimes, but you have to try. You have to try to respond. Yeah. And David, <laughs> I'm going to call you out on this one because uh -oh. you have had an open letter series on your blog. Oh, yeah. oh you noticed. Thank you. Uh, yes, yes, yes. That was actually one of the other reasons why I was like, that he needs to be on this discussion. <laughs> Uh, so look, tell us a little bit about that. And, and Well, there's, there's a movement in town, uh, some really uh, um, great people. I'm not attached to the group at all. They're doing Tuesdays with Toomey. Mm. That their general protest, if that's even the right word, is that he, he does, uh, Toomey is a senator, state senator, uh, the senator for the state of Pennsylvania. 
um, and they are complaining that he is inaccessible. And initially, I think some of the protests ha were having to do with uh, uh, the recall of um, the Affordable Care Act and other things. And so they're protesting the idea that they can't really get in contact with him. So there are groups of people in his offices or around his offices. There's one in Pittsburgh, there's one in Harrisburg, there's one in, uh, there's three or four, there's one in Erie, I think, who will show up on Tuesdays because it kind of, it's an alliteration, Tuesdays with Toomey. And I thought, oh, that's really cool. It's a great idea. How can I steal it? You know? Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I, I can't participate with them because I, I can't take the time off of work, but I can do something like it. And so that is my uh, open letters to Senator Toomey. And I think I'm up to 11. And I got one response so far. Um, so they're, they're all posted. I, I take the text that I blog, print it out, put it on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope, mail it to his local Pittsburgh office. The Pittsburgh office at one point was on, uh, I guess, Station Square, and then they moved it to Grant Street, so I moved mm -hmm. the, the address as well. Uh, I put a business card into the blog, uh, into the envelope for the, for the blog. And then, uh, so what he gets in the mail is actually what's been posted uh, online. And uh, um, so I usually start thinking in the, during the weekend about what the next question will be. Because they, the, as a, it has to be written a little differently than a blog post because you really can't include the hyperlinks on, in a letter. You know, mm -hmm. it's just a piece of paper. It's so old school, it's actually paper. <laughs> and, but I mean, I've read someplace that, that uh, political offices, senatorial offices, House of Representatives, they pay really close attention to, to if someone sends in a letter rather than um, uh, uh, types in an email. Because you can cut and paste an email um, you can, if you, if, if you send a, a, a tweet through Twitter, you know, that, that can, that's ephemeral, it's gone in a second, but actually something with a piece of paper that almost always demands a response. So I decided that whatever he, he sends back, I scan and I post that and then I'll, ana uh, I'll analyze it. That's actually a really good point. I, I can speak to that as having worked as a constituent outreach specialist that you'll get you know, maybe a hundred emails that's literally the exact same All thing, word same. for word, yeah. and you respond to it, but then you pretty much respond with a form letter of your own versus, uh, you know, right. actual human response. So. Yeah, yeah. It just, it's the law of diminishing returns, right? Mm -hmm. It just seems less valuable when it's uh, copy and paste um, from a from hundred different people. It doesn't, um, some it's not... organization that's telling you what they want you to say. Yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. So... So all of, obviously all of mine, I mean, I'm, I'm cutting and pasting the, the blog content into a letter, but it's, it's just, it's all mine. You're still taking that extra step though to, yeah. Yeah. to do it. Now, on the flip side of that, how does your office handle, I guess, the, the social media versus the, and your office being as Natalia's yeah. staff? Yeah. So we had to learn, um to separate our personal uh, accounts on Facebook, for example, from the office account. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, at first Natalia got elected and she kept her personal account and she had thousands and thousands of friends and she reached her limit and actually couldn't have any more friends. And it was starting to bleed into her personal life and staff couldn't access the account to respond to people the way she could. And so it was an extra burden on her to cut and paste messages that came to her into email and send it to us. So we actually created an office page, obviously, um, and tried to migrate as many of her, you know, constituents over to that page as possible. And now we just, you know, we all have the app on our phones. We're always watching. Um, we get the notifications. And so in a lot of ways, it's improved constituent services. Um, and it's also meant that we're checking, we're checking work things at 10 p.m. at night, you know, and the really urgent ones, we, we do not save until the morning. We're answering and messaging. We're WhatsApping, actually, back and forth <laughs> among the, the four of us staff about how to respond. So um, we, we're really, um, I, I would call it a system, even though it seems kind of like just, uh, I don't know, we're, we don't have like a formal process when something comes in, well, we put it in this box and then we respond to it. 
24 hours later, we, we respond as quickly as we can. And um, even if we, like I said earlier, even if we don't have an answer, we, t we say, don't have an answer, here's who I'm gonna check in with, um, you know, here's who's responsible for that, and we'll let you know as soon as we can. So I don't know if that answers your question. No, the, I've gotten far away from your original question. <laughs> that, that is the politician, correct? I'm so, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm just, it's I'm the end of the day. No, I know, I know. I know. Um, did you have something to add to that, Brian? Um, the only thing I could add was as far as like turning people off. I mean, this is the first time where it's happened to me where I've turned people off, and it's mm. because... You know, I'm not a politician now, so I can do that a little bit uh, with certain people, just kind of hide their posts. And that really came about because of my involvement in the music community, where, you know, they're very opposed to Donald Trump, which I understand. I don't like a lot of his policies. Some of them, you know, some of the things he does I like, some of them I don't. Um, but these people would just come through and just whine and moan and, and point the almighty finger and like to call names and it's just like and because I'm so involved in that community it was just such an overload of this non-stop so there are a few people who I've kind of clicked the unfollow button on so that way I don't have to listen to them whine because mm -hmm. you can only hear somebody complain and say the exact same thing over and over again so many times so uh, this year is the first year that I've really kind of turned a few people off but it wasn't anything added that was really of any value. It was just, I'm mad, I'm whining, I'm not going to do anything about it, but post to my, you know, 20 friends who think the exact same way as me. But don't so. you think a lot of people did that over the last year, like leading up to the November election? So many of us unfollowed friends on Facebook who, you know, I, I don't want to unfriend you. Yes. I just mm -hmm. cannot take what you're saying right now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I will check back with you later. And I wonder how much we've actually reconnected with the people that we didn't agree with. Yeah. Well, and to be honest, that was one of the things yeah. when I, again, had this, I saw all of the completely opposite ends of the spectrum discussion going on with Twitter. So you're either in one camp or you're in mm -hmm. the other. And oh, there sure. really wasn't much middle ground. Mm -mm. And... I guarantee you if Trump had lost and Hillary had won, I would be unfollowing a lot of my friends from Westmoreland County. So you're right. It's on both sides. It's not, it's not a Trump or Hillary thing, but it's just this, you know, both of the candidates were so polarizing that, you know, the two groups, it's like, my world is over. I, can't, I don't yeah. know how I'm going to survive. And it's, it's, you know, we've, you'll get through it. <laughs> well, and like the interesting thing about, you know, I was a Hillary supporter and mm -hmm. so there was a time in the primary when it was like not cool to be a Hillary supporter because mm -hmm. we had a lot of Bernie friends, right? And so you actually had these private Facebook groups cropping up with just people collecting together and talking about how great they thought Hillary was, um, but so no one else could see them because they did, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was hard to like constantly be shooing off criticism about it. And so like you had... Pittsburgh progressives for Hillary crop up and then you had Pantsuit Nation and mm -hmm. some other groups with bad words in them that I won't say here. But um, mm. yeah, I mean, it was it was a very interesting phenomenon to see these private groups crop up where people could just like be themselves and not have to argue with supporters of other candidates. I think that was probably one of the more vicious primaries that I've seen mm -hmm. uh, in the Democratic yeah, primary this year. I would say so. People were very passionate yeah. towards one candidate or another. Yeah. Well, it was kind of, um, I mean, eight years before, I remember seeing things that were very similar mm -hmm. between uh, uh, the Hillary Clinton supporters and the Obama supporters. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Maria and I actually did a short video at the Post-Gazette because she was a Hillary person, I was an Obama person. And we started kind of um, discussing things on the blog and then the comments started getting really nasty. And I said, oh, okay, no, 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 I'm not going to do this. I mean, if someone wants to comment, they can start their own blog. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of the interesting part is that a lot of the arguments, or at least a lot of the two sides pointing at the, at the other, whether it was Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton this, this cycle or eight years ago, it, was, it felt very similar to me, very, very familiar. Mm -hmm. So at least from my, from my perspective, I was... I would support whoever won the primary on the Democratic side. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't going to get involved in Bernie bros versus the pantsuit nation or whatever the, the you know, because yeah. um, it, it felt very, uh, what's the word, um, counterproductive to me. 
Yeah, and I think it's a shame how the way that we've treated each other through this uh, campaign. It's just like people like will yeah. lose friendships over something like that. And you know, I, I I've grown up with friends on all sides of the the political spectrum, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know. I just remember you know early on, and you know, I will smack myself for saying this, but in the very very beginning, the very beginning of this political campaign season. Uh, before he opened his mouth, I liked the idea of Donald Trump as a businessman who wasn't a, a Washington insider. Okay. And he started talking, um, <laughs> so then things changed. But I liked that concept, and uh, you know, when he first announced, and I, you know, said something about, oh, it sounds like great, and some guy immediately like unfriended me because, oh, heaven forbid, and I'm, I'm like, you, you can't even be friends with somebody who has a difference of opinion, yeah. and, and I can yeah. understand as you know things develop, you know. People get emotional. I mean, this is at the very, very beginning before, you know, Donald Trump said anything about Mexicans or really anything at all. He had just announced that he was running. So, I had I had roughly the same thing happen in '92 with mm -hmm. uh, Ross Perot. I liked the idea that here's a guy who had his own money um, and wasn't beholden to anyone uh, to uh, hold a position. And then he started talking, you know, exactly yeah. what you said. And then he started talking. Oh, exactly. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> the idea is great, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but then, then it was, it was okay, now oh. Ross Perot's talking, you know. Mm -hmm. Giant sucking sound. Do we have an audience question? I don't want to. Oh, we do have an audience question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was like, where is this question coming from? So, yes, what, what is your question? <laughs> I see a well, timid hand. Well, how far my reach? Not far enough. Thank you so much. Uh, I have a question for the panel. Yeah? Um, so I find it interesting when you sort of talk about the combativeness of these two primaries, 2018 and 2016, uh, Democratic presidential, um, and you cite that as, as in many respects a negative. Um, but it also strikes me that those are the, the only two primary elections, at least in my lifetime, when people in my life who are not like people who self-define as political people yeah. actively engaged, right? Like the other side of the coin from combativeness was engagement. And maybe in mm -hmm. 2000, there weren't any uh, Bill Bradley bros, but that was because I <laughs> no uh, knew who Bill Bradley was. I'm sure there are Bill Bradley bros listening to this, uh, in which case, Godspeed. But uh, I guess that's my question. Um, is there, are there models uh, of engagement that, that don't have that combativeness? Is, mm -hmm. is uh, a lack of that combativeness that we saw in 2016 necessarily um, desirable? Mm. Well, I think you get a passion without being combative. I, I remember volunteering for the, uh, one of the special elections which had you know, national attention on this race because it was a special election. It was the only one going on. So both sides had just money pouring in from every special interest group from you know, New Hampshire to California here in Pennsylvania. And I was standing outside and it was pouring and there were, I was on one side, there were two old ladies who were on the other side and they gave me an umbrella. And here we are both standing in the middle of the pouring rain mm -hmm. For opposite people, but you know, it wasn't like she, you know, like this year. I feel like she probably would have taken that umbrella and started beating me with it. But I liked the fact that you could go out there and you could have a difference of opinion, but you could still accept the fact that you're both people, and, yeah. and continue to live <laughs> in, in peace. So I guess, I, you know, I like, I like that people are interested, but I've also been one to often say that. Uh, Everyone has the right to vote, but if you can't even Google the name of a candidate before you walk into the voting booth, maybe you shouldn't vote. So um, a lot of people voted, you know, vote, and they don't really know anything about the candidates they're voting for either. So. No, but I think you're right. A lot of people did get more engaged and actually did the research and looked into their candidates. Um, so, yeah, that's admirable. Um, I think we all lost friends over it, you know, so it is a shame that it got so heated. Um I mean, I remember it came up, came up at the bar one night. It wasn't even on Facebook, you know, so it happened in real life too. Um, and maybe Facebook amplified that in a way because, you know, people, I don't know, I think people became more um, set in their positions and um, were more comfortable saying things and making sweeping judgments about their friends based on their political opinions than maybe we would be just sitting around the dinner table. It's also easier to run your mouth behind a keyboard than it is. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I was just about to say that. I think yeah. the, 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 the 
method of communication um, gives a certain amount of insulation to whoever's writing. Mm -hmm. And so you can, if you are, you know, if your name is whatever, 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 and your Twitter handle is, uh, you know, blog post five, <laughs> you know, you can very easily type out, die, you're so proud of that. Yeah. And then hit the thing, yeah. and you're, you're not you're, you're you're not having to uh, actually deal with another human being because it's just words on the page, and then that am, ends up amplifying. Um, so yeah, you you have a certain amount of distance, which kind of purifies people's anger. And then that carried into real life yeah. in a lot of cases, I think. Okay. Yeah. Now, here's here's a kind of follow up question with regard to that. Um, what are your thoughts on social media having an, an, an impact, if any, on social media, uh, I'm sorry, on political agendas? Because obviously the constituency is, is speaking out on social media. Are politicians actually listening to that? I don't know. Well, I mean, it, kind of what, what we were talking about before, there are, there are layers of things mm -hmm. where... Um, what was it? It was it was right after the election. Uh, someone had put out a pamphlet or something, 13, 14 pages. I have it saved on my computer. Um, mm, on you know what political offices, what messages political offices pay attention to, and they won't really pay attention if you load something on a, a Facebook comment uh, or if it's necessarily a tweet because that's very easy to do. So. I mean, it depends on. I, I still, I still would think that politicians would count when people actually show up and do something, rather than sit at their keyboards and write something. I don't know. I mean, I think that social media, in many cases now, forces politicians of all sorts at all levels to answer questions that they could, you know, avoid in other situations. So, you know, someone asks you how you feel about Black Lives Matter. Well. You better think about that. You better come up with the answer because once you put it online, it'll, it's out there forever. Mm -hmm. And um, so you need to think seriously about your own feelings about it and your constituency's feelings about it and make a decision. So I think it does, you know, put, put elected officials on, a, on the spot in a good way um, sometimes. My former boss... Uh, Representative Dunbar always had a saying that signs don't vote. So yeah. I agree with you, but at the same, on the flip side, a lot of the people who will run their mouths on Facebook or Twitter will never go to a voting booth or never actually do anything constructive or to enact any kind of real change. So, oh. what's or that? will they? Well, I think a lot of them will. I think some of them will. Some of them will, but uh, a lot of them are. You know, it's like when people talked about, you know. How can you know Bernie Sanders not have won? He had the biggest rallies. It's the same kind of thing. It's easy. It's fun to go to a rally. It's boring to go stand in line and click a few buttons on a machine. It's fun to run your mouth on Facebook and be you know, the Facebook king for the day. But oh man, I gotta you know wake up and go out early before work to click yeah. a button. Like it's not as exciting or as juicy. It's, it's I don't kind know. of crazy because it should be because that's what really. <laughs> it makes a difference, yeah. but yeah, I think a lot of people online obviously do vote, and you know maybe people getting engaged in issues first on Facebook or first on Twitter, um, you know if if they don't get answers from their elected officials and they don't you know hear the answers they want to hear, that is powerful. That's a motivator, right? So. Maybe some folks aren't voting now, but it could motivate them to vote in the future. Well, it future. can also cause a lot of issues, too. So say, like you said, with the Black Lives Matter comment, if somebody makes uh, the, the wrong comment back, and like you said, all of a sudden it's sharing everywhere, it could, you know, it could go viral, and it could be all across you know, the, the nation. Everybody could be seeing this. Um, I'm yeah. trying to think of, like, a, a good example is uh, whenever they've, there's been several politicians where the aide is managing the Twitter account and they think they're on their personal account and they're saying, you know, sexy comments across the, you know, <laughs> politician's checkmarked Twitter account mm. and all of a sudden that's everywhere. Or Anthony Weiner, you know, look at, look at, with him. But that was and, actually him, though. That was actually him, <laughs> yes. <laughs> but again, 
faux pas, it's everywhere. Well, and that's that's funny that you mentioned Anthony Weiner because that was one of my questions. Is which social media faux pas incident stands out as a good example of what not to do as a politician or figurehead using social media? Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean. Yeah, dick pics are probably a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> Especially dick pics with your kid in the picture. Yeah. Oh, oh. yeah. But yeah, was that any, really social any. media or was that... I thought that came off of like someone released that someone who had received the text released it yeah, i think a, you're right yeah, it, but, yeah. but that, that's kind of like it's the, the same thing yeah, yeah. yeah. Especially, especially this day and age I mean. if it's on here it's out there mm-hmm. <laughs> pretty much yeah um, but yeah we, we won't actually touch upon that question but it was one that i had tagged just just in case the conversation wasn't yeah. wasn't flowing yeah. um so here's here's a fun follow-up question uh there's been some some discourse with regard to the current press room in in the national press corps. Social media, it's there's been a question since social media came into play as to whether it should be included as regular press, mm. like as part of the news. Yeah, as, as yeah. part of the news. Uh, what what are what are thoughts as far as that's concerned? I mean, when the president says something, it's news, isn't it? Mm-hmm. And Twitter is saying something. Like, posting something on Twitter is the same as standing at a podium and saying words. So, you know, there's a lot to report on there, but I think it does qualify as news. Yeah. Well, the thing, too, also, that is interesting about this president, even though you know, maybe somebody should take his keyboard away from him because yeah. he tweets is not right. But no. he's actually been very innovative in using social media. He's done a lot with Facebook Live to outreach to people. I know that there are times in the, the press briefings where they'll actually take video Skype calls from internet media companies. Really? So he's been very open-minded to reaching out to alternative media that not alternative as far as like, you know, some form of, you know, a Heritage Foundation offshoot, but alternative in the fact that you know, maybe someone like my station, as it grows, maybe they would take a call from from that mm-hmm. type of an organization. And mm-hmm. I thought that's actually very forward thinking on the current administration's uh, part to kind of explore those other options and utilize things like Facebook Live and things like that mm-hmm. to try to reach out to more people and get different perspectives. Well, I, I, I would guess that it depends on the politician, with how the politician views media, mm-hmm. whether it's... Um, media in the sense of, you know, kind of a conduit between the politician and the public or a filter or a filter like a lens that bends the, you know. I mean, you can kind of tell, I think in in this administration, we tend to think of what they would call the mainstream media as, I mean, Trump does it seemingly every day calling it fake news, whether it's the failing New York Times or the failing whatever, 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 that his view of the mainstream media, newspapers, television, even CNN, uh, MSNBC, I don't think Fox necessarily uh, gets folded into that, that it's a distorting medium rather than a communicating communicating medium. Um, and all of these things are, are, are actually very relative. I, I knew a guy, has, well, this is 20 years ago, uh, Fox News had just come on the air. And... Uh, he made a blanket. He was a he was a he was a college kid, so obviously he knew everything, mm-hmm. because that's what happens when you're in college. And he made a blanket statement that the entire news media is liberal. And I thought, it, <laughs> so I, I go, okay, I got to challenge this kid on this because he was a kid. And I said, really, the entire news media? It's like even Fox News. He said, yeah, Fox News is, is liberal. I said, how can that be? I mean, Roger Ailes, he's the guy who put <laughs> Morning in America, the guy who put Ronald Reagan, I think at least in the 84 election. How can you say he's a little... And the kid said, with absolute certainty, Roger Ailes is, at best, a centrist. So here's a kid who is so far to the right wow. that everything to the left was just the liberal media. I mean, so that's, that's one of the, the problems with how politicians would deal with the media, because... Where they see it placed, is it a communicating medium? Is it a filter or is it a distortion? Obviously, this president thinks it's a distortion. So the, the tweets are jumping over um, the reporters who are just going to spin it you know, wrong anyway. So he's communicating with 
everybody, and he says what he, what he says. Now, Sorg actually brought to my attention that we, we actually have people in the chat room. Hi, Steve. Hey. Uh, Hi. <laughs> he made a comment, and this is one that I kind of had in the back of my pocket toward the end of things, but since he brought it up, I'll, I'll bring it into play now. It used to be that you didn't talk politics, sex, or religion mm -hmm. in a public forum. And now, especially with social media and the instantaneous accessibility of it, that doesn't seem to be the case. And we're, we're having a conversation about social media and politics. <laughs> and Anthony Weiner. So yeah, exactly. There's, exactly. Sorry, there, there you go. there's politics, there's sex, and there's, well, I, it doesn't. Uh, it's House of Cards. Oh. Which I've never seen, actually. Oh. Really? Oh, that's great. <laughs> I thought this was going to be civil. Oh. <laughs> My God. We're going to pin you down and make you watch it. <laughs> I did catch a couple of episodes of the original British um, okay. uh, series. Yeah. Um, with. Uh, Which is much more realistic. Red Grave. In the grand scheme of things. Yeah, who played, who played the Prime Minister in that? Um, I can't remember. Was that. Uh, I can't remember. I can't remember. There was a great commercial, though, in the early 90s. It was one of those great Poupon commercials, mm -hmm. and it was for British audiences. And at that point, there were two really great TV series with someone playing a fictional uh, prime minister. One was House of Cards, and the other was Yes, Prime Minister, with uh, Paul Eddington, I think. Mm. And so you see the two Rolls Royces pull up to you, and the windows go down, and there's one fictional... One actor who plays a fictional uh, prime minister talking to the other. It was a really great moment. It doesn't have anything to do with anything. It's kind of a rhetorical <laughs> sorbet. You know? <laughs> it's a rhetorical sorbet to cleanse the palate. So, you know, when you start talking about Anthony Weiner again, we, uh, oh, we don't have such a bad taste in our mouth. <laughs> I've always okay. talked about politics and religion in public and that even at work. I mean, within... A certain way. You can't just go out and, and you know campaign at work and cause work-related issues. But if there's somebody you know and you know that they're not super inflammatory or they're not going to get set off by something small, I think you know it's, it's good to talk about important issues. I'd rather have a real dialogue and a real conversation than uh, you know this. You know it's, it's, the weather's nice today. What are you supposed yeah. to do? Talk about just superficial stuff all the time? And and I think it's better that we live in a society where you can talk about these real issues and have conversations. What worries me is, as I was saying earlier, with all of this, uh, this, this vitriol that we've had during this election, it's actually getting towards the, the opposite, where you can't even express your opinion, yeah. because the moment you do, uh, if you, know, you mention Hillary and the Bernie bros jump down your back, you, you, know, you mention... Or the Anybody, opposite. Or, that happened to you. Let's yeah. not mm. <laughs> throw stones. <laughs> well, I, I would think that, you know, if you look at the reason why the cultural tradition of not talking about religion and politics and sex at the dinner table is because uh, those arguments very quickly get very heated and there's really no way to resolve them. You know, it's not like you can go, okay, well, who... Who's taller, me or Uncle Bill? Mm -hmm. You know, you just stand in, one's taller than the other. But you can't, at the dinner table, you simply cannot resolve um, a political discussion or a uh, true definition of the Trinity, you know, over being But does every super. question have to be resolved? I mean, sometimes you can have a conversation and you can walk away with the same opinions, but if you're able to at least listen. Except that, that it's very easy for those things, if you're having a family dinner, then it gets uncomfortable very quickly. Mm -hmm. So the I, I would think that the the current situation of well, we can talk about it now is that those restraints are off. Mm -hmm. You know, it's 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 now not unacceptable to start screaming at for mm -hmm. whatever the topic to start mm -hmm. screaming at the, the person on the other side of the table because they happen to disagree with you about, you know, um, where Donald Trump's hands have been. Yeah. Well, these fe <laughs> things feel very personal, right? You know, when we have political candidates who are uh, busted for saying awful things about women. You know, to a young woman, it can feel very personal, like electing this man is a, an affront to women, mm -hmm. right? And so it's hard not to get emotional and um, yell sometimes. So yeah. it's not just that it's not a social, you know, we don't have those limitations socially anymore. It's like it got more personal politically. I'm, I'm not. I'm not disagreeing. Yeah. So 
as, as we mentioned when we did the introductions here, uh, each of you can, and people in general, tend to use one or two forms of social media over another. Um, obviously, we, we've got a blogger over here. We've, we've got someone who's using Facebook Live. Yeah. And Brian, you do a lot with like online podcasting and like streaming radio stuff. Yeah, so... Um, as as well as social media and lots yeah. of stuff as well, too. Um, mm-hmm. How do you feel that your chosen form of social media best suits what your message is? Like, why, why did you pick what you did for, for your outreach? You start. Yeah. Um, I'm just... yeah, start with the old guy. Um, <laughs> uh, well, it's, it's, for me, I, and I can't speak for anyone else, I certainly can't speak for Maria, mm-hmm. but what I'm aiming at when I'm blogging is that, um, for instance, I, I, until they, they went paperless, I spent a lot of time uh, uh, debunking the editorial board of the, the Tribune Review if they were to talk about uh, climate change. And basically, I figured that the people who are fans of the Tribune Review, people who agree those guys are the greatest thing since, since sliced bread, uh, I'm not going to change their opinion at all. Uh, people who are my fans, um, they're obviously very intelligent, very discerning, uh, wonderful people. Um, but I'm aiming towards everyone in the middle. And so if someone Googles, say, the Paris Conference or uh, uh, receding glaciers on Kilimanjaro or whatever, I'm hoping that they'll find the Tribune Review uh, link and then my link right below it saying, well, that's, that's a load of um, bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so that's why I do what I do, so that there is a dissenting voice to a um, uh, very well-funded, very well-organized uh, conservative set of viewpoints on, online. So I, I tend not to spend that much time tweeting. I think I might have like 40 tweets, uh, very few tweets. Mm-hmm. But it's, once it's out there, it's out there for anyone to find if they Google or if they're using Bing or whatever the search engines are these days. Oh, me. Okay. So, well, when you're running for office, you're scrambling for ways to get the word out. Um, And, you know, we are running a really grassroots campaign. We're talking to people at the doors. And um, you can only have so many of those conversations, um, just the limitations of time and, you know, how many steps you can take in a day. And um, we have had news articles printed about this race. And like you were saying earlier, the media um, can have a point of view sometimes. It can, it can distort um, sometimes. I know like lots of people have had the experience of talking to a reporter and not exactly loving the way the article came out or realizing, oh my gosh, they think I'm the underdog here. Or um, they're framing the race in a way that I wouldn't. And so we were, you know, plugging along on Facebook, just kind of promoting events for people to help us volunteer and door knock and make phone calls. And I thought, we really need to start talking about the issues that people are asking me about at the doors online. Um, And what's the best way to do that? So we came up with this idea, Issue Monday, where people can um, submit questions on our Facebook page or message us directly and I sit on Facebook Live and answer their questions. And it's a really great format because it is like a discussion with people. It's also, you know, word for word, it's all me. You know, it's, so it's not like, um, it's not uh, summarized at all. It is my full explanation of the issue and what I think. And I get to keep notes there. And, you know, it's, it's actually more realistic because, um, it's not a one-liner about a complicated issue like affordable housing or immigration. It's, look, this is a complex issue. Let me tell you why I think it's complex. Let me tell you what city council has to do with that. Let, you know, here's what I will do. Um, so it's given us the flexibility to have, I think, fuller conversations. And, um, you know, every we do it every week. And we've been doing it for seven weeks now. And I feel like Every week we build a bigger audience, watching it live, responding, um, watching it later too. Um, And it's it's been really good for our campaign. And I I certainly think, you know, you talk about voters going out and Googling their candidates uh, to figure out who to vote for. 
there is so much information out there now about what I stand for that you couldn't possibly be, you know, an undereducated voter in this election. You have every opportunity to know what you need to know. So that's why we, I mean, we just, I wouldn't say we chose Facebook Live over any other tool. It just seemed very accessible and very available to us at the time. And I don't know what Snapchat is, so. <laughs> well, I think, and I use Facebook Live a lot, and I think you and I are very similar in, in our goal, or in our reach, I should say, where we're both reaching out to a very localized audience. You've yeah. got a part of a city, you know, I've got the, the city that I'm trying to reach out to, but Pittsburgh really is smaller than a borough in New York, for mm -hmm. example, so it's a small city. And Facebook, to me, from at least my experience, does a much better job of reaching people on the local level. And it seems like because it's your friends, they like certain organizations, and if you're able to tag the mm -hmm. right groups and the right people, right. it gets into more people's timelines, and you're able to reach more people that way. So, so I use Facebook a lot, and another big thing I use, I don't know if it's really, if you would call it social media, but TuneIn Radio, which is an app on your phone, that's been very beneficial for someone like me who doesn't have really any money to, to spend in advertising. So people were able to just click that local button and the river's edge is right there with, you know, some of the more old fashioned radio stations that, you know, people have grown up with. So we're easy to find that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing, if I could ask her a question, oh, yeah, because mm -hmm. we were talking about you use a lot utilizing Facebook. Yeah. And I think it's interesting in, in running a local election and you can maybe tell me if I'm wrong because it's been a few years, but with all of the social media and all of the outreach, still none of it is, puts a, a mark on walking up to someone's door and oh, talking. No. no, you have to have individual conversations with people. And you know, part of the science of trying to figure out if you can win a, a race or not is you know, asking people if you can count on their vote and, mm -hmm. and knowing what your voter universe looks like. And you know, we have measures of understanding um, who is likely to show up and vote mm -hmm. in the May primary, and, and we're talking to those people. So, yeah, nothing substitutes. You can't just have a Facebook page and expect to win an election. That is, no. you have and, to go to community meetings. You have to show up. And I know at least on a uh, statewide or a Commonwealth level, if you don't knock on so many doors, that'll actually affect the amount of funding that you'll get from oh. from yeah from your caucus and other places. Like they aren't going to send you as much money if they you don't they don't see you knocking on X amount of doors mm -hmm. because they know that you're not putting in the time that is needed to win a race. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Well, I have just one more question that I wanted to finish out with, and Ashley, I'm going to have you answer last on this one. Okay. Using the various uh, social media options that we have available today. If you were running a political campaign today, what would be your social media recommendations? <laughs> this is why you're going last, Ashley. <laughs> to me, it would depend on what you're running on. To me, if you're running on a federal level, that makes a big difference. And like, like I said with Facebook on a local level, mm -hmm. it really is a really great tool to access people. It seems like Twitter, even though they don't have as many users, it seems like when you tweet something, it's easy for the media to pick up. So on a federal level, it seems like when you have that short little burst, that one-liner, it's easy for CNN and Fox and MSNBC and all of these people to share it and talk about it because it's an easy, small bit, and they love sound bites. So if I was going, I, me personally, if I was organizing a, a national campaign, I think Twitter would make more sense. But on a local level, I would definitely say Facebook. Okay, well, we'll keep it local because this is a uh, podcast Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. uh, so we'll we'll keep it to the local stuff. But do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, <laughs> I, uh, um, no, actually, I, I when I when I initially read the question that you'd send out, my thoughts um, probably was being uh, rather uh, um, uh, myopic. Um, my thoughts kind of moved towards having someone on the staff who would watch all of the social media because uh, who knows where a, an idea of um, candidate X actually is a, you know, he doesn't or she doesn't live in the area, they fly in from Anchorage every day or some, some, mm -hmm. uh, something that's obviously incorrect. Uh, you know, there, everyone knows the Mark Twain line of, you know, a lie can make it halfway around the planet before the truth gets his pants on. So, my recommendation, for what it's worth, would be uh, having someone watching 
all of the reactions to things and making sure that there is not necessarily a uh, like the worst thing the worst thing anyone can do is send a message verbally or not un otherwise that someone like me has gotten under their skin because then someone like me will keep pushing the, the mm -hmm. whatever is under the skin um, but there are ways to address things that are out there that that are uh, not true not that I've ever said anything that wasn't true mm -hmm. but having someone who can react and get the truth out in a way that it blankets everything as a kind of a, a vaccine for um, whatever untruth is there mm -hmm. so whether it's on whether it's a uh, um, uh, you know, tweets or, or kind of Facebook thing or something else, just to make sure that, you know, your side of the argument is out there. Or else, I mean, we saw it, we saw it in 2004 with the, the Swift Boat um, Veterans for Truth. I mean, mm -hmm. the, one of the faults was that the, that whole month of August, John Kerry was on vacation, probably assuming, I always assumed that he figured that they would never go after a war hero. And they did, and he was silent. And so enough people, I mean, if 100,000 people in Ohio voted differently, there wouldn't have been a second uh, Bush administration, or yeah, second Bush administration. But he didn't, and no one was there to say, no, that's, that's, that's just wrong. That's simply factually incorrect. Someone has to be out there saying whatever is wrong is actually wrong. Yeah. That answer your question? Yeah, that, no, just... that, that was actually a very good answer to the question. Yeah. Oh, well, I had my Wheaties today. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's true. You have to have help, right? You can't, um, you can't actively respond to people and be on top of everything by yourself, especially when you're a candidate and running around trying to cover all your bases in the community and knock doors and, and be everywhere all at once. So you have to have help, whether it's volunteer or paid staff. Um, I personally use Twitter and Facebook, and I do use them a little bit differently. So Twitter is, it started out as my personal Twitter and my, uh, my you know, it, it evolved into kind of my professional Twitter and now my campaign Twitter. It's, it's me, right? It's everywhere I am. It's pictures of me at a community meeting or talking, you know, advertising community meetings, um, talking about things I did at work that day or me and my son, you know, and our little hangout over the weekend or, you know, today um, a picture of a ball field getting fixed, right? Um, so it's really a record of where I am and, you know, uh, it's, it's a different audience than Facebook. It feels less interactive, you know, people retweet, but it's, it's really just kind of my diary like here's where I am isn't that cool okay see ya um and then Facebook um has been really interesting in a number of ways you know the Facebook live has been incredibly valuable it's also a good way to rope in all of the constituencies that you want to talk to so for example um you know we're able to highlight endorsements in a really targeted way so I got the endorsement of the Pittsburgh Federation of Teachers, the teachers union. So um, we put that out there. We tagged PFT um, so their members would see that. And then we actually, sometimes you do have to do paid ads. It's not, you know, there's no shame mm -hmm. in non-organic growth, right? So we paid for an ad and it was really affordable. Um, running on the local level, we don't have... But there's not the budget to go on TV, right? Especially at the city council level. We're not going to do that. So mm -hmm. we did a $20 Facebook ad and, and Facebook allows you to be so targeted in who you're talking to. So these, you know, people who live in our area, our zip codes, people who might be interested in education or who are teachers. And oh my gosh, you know, the response we got was great. And we knew we were talking to the people we wanted to be talking to. So, um, yeah. I think it's been incredibly valuable. I, uh, I, I don't know what else to say. I'm sure I could go on and on about it if you, if you let me. But um, well, I, I appreciate the insight on that. Yeah. Um, do you guys have anything else that you'd you'd like to toss in for the conversation, or? <laughs> I, I think we're I think we're good. Be careful, folks. Look at me. <laughs> yeah, I, I, <laughs> have I been? Do you have too something much? to say? No, no, no. You're no. good. I apologize. Not at all. Not at all. Do we have any Not questions from the audience? Chat room. All right, then I, I think that uh, we're good to go. Thank you guys so much for, for joining us for this. Yes. And before we go, let's tell people where we can find you. Mm. 
We'll start with Brian. All right. You can find me Friday morning, 10 a.m. at Mullins Diner. We're going to be talking about Trump's 99th day in office. We've got uh, Drew Laswell, Andrew Laswell, who's a musician who writes anti-Trump songs. And we're going to put him on uh, the air with Mike McMullen, who is a big Trump supporter. He went to the, the nomination and everything. So it'll be an interesting time. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at RiverTalkPGH and uh, on Facebook, the website for the River's Edge, RiversEdgePGH.com, and it's at RiversEdgePGH on all the, the social medias. David, where can we find you? Oh, I, I blog at the blog to politicaljunkies.blogspot.com. And that's two is in the number two, correct? Two is in the number two, yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, there's new content. If there's new content, it's usually posted on weekdays by about... 6.30 in the morning. Uh, weekends, it might be around 9 o'clock. If there's nothing there by 11, then there's not going to be anything on weekends. And if there's nothing there by 8, you know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Ashley, where can we find you? Well, you can find me on Twitter at, Ash at Ashley Deemer. But my name's spelled funny. So my first name is A-S-H-L-E-I-G-H, not L-E-Y. Um, and you can find me at the same spelling on Facebook, Ashley Deemer for City Council. So check us out. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, thanks again. It's been a great conversation. Uh, fun little little discourse over here. So no, it's been good. And for those of you who are interested in the video end of things, we also have their links to their social media, their websites, and everything on the Facebook information, as well as on the PodCamp website article.